feet are cold and I can't find my slippers. Oh. You want any thick socks? Yeah, but I don't want to go upstairs. Um, can you sit on your feet by crossing? That's your what legs? I'm doing right now. <laughs> What? I've got nothing. I, like, I kind of want that in the podcast. Listeners, my feet are freezing. <laughs> <laughs> I think, that's, I think that's a stretch. Well, I can't find my slippers. And so that's that. And also, we're talking about portion sizes and normal serving sizes, quote unquote, inverted commas, mm-hmm. today, today here on Life After Diets. If you've been so messed up by dieting and diet culture, Chances are you don't know how much food is the amount of food for you. You know what? I think I'm still a little bit like, I think there's a part of that in my brain that is still like, I have to override it. You know what I mean? Like it's still there. I think this, this also, um, first of all, I want to clarify that. I absolutely a hundred percent do not subscribe to the portion size thing cognitively, but like, there's always that, you know, the back of the mind, but also I think partly that's because. I have a big appetite. So there's some kind of level of awareness of that that keeps me aware that a portion size is probably not a portion size for me. Like usually, I feel like it isn't. And so I have this awareness of it. Were you somebody who was very conscious of portion sizes and would try to adhere to them? Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't. Oh, no? No. I I, I had to. I mean, go ahead. What, how not? Because I think that my eating, and I've talked about this before, was more permissive. It was more rebellious. Even though I wanted to not be binging, even though I wanted to lose weight, I would look at these portion sizes and I would think, F you, you don't get to tell me how much a portion size is. Oh, so I've, I've never been one to measure out portion sizes or pay a blind bit of attention to them. Oh, oh, so I'm not, so I paid plenty of attention to them, but I would blow past them. And the second I blew past a portion of serving I assumed I'd fail and that would, it would, I'm not telling you that like I adhered to it. I'm just saying that the should was in my Oh, brain. I get it. Yeah. The yeah. should wasn't. I was right from the beginning. There was no part of me that thought that that well, that's made helpful. any sense. Probably. Probably. Let's play a little game. Mm. Shall we? Yeah. So I, I have a bag of crisps, AKA chips, kettle mm-hmm. chips. Do you have kettle chips? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. That particular brand I think we have, but in a different bag. Well, this, these were hand cooked in Norfolk and I'm in Norfolk at the moment. And <sighs> their headquarters are in Dublin. <laughs> what? I know. So this bag is 130 grams, which for you as an American is five ounces, just over five ounces. Okay. So how much do you think they are saying a serving size is? And bearing in mind, they're not doing the thing which many products do where they say only X number of calories per serving or only X number of sugar per serving. They're not yeah. yelling about their servings on the front. But how much do you reckon a recommended serving of this my guess, um, first of all, I'm having a really hard time understanding if that bag is like, is that a single bag or a, oh, that's a, it's a whole bag of chips, like not like a, a single serving kind of thing. Right. My guess was like 12 chip, nine or 12 chips would be the serving size. Do they do it like that? No, they, they do they that here. Wait. Oh, really? They'll do it per, for number of chips. And, in a lot of things they do number of chips. So, so that makes it easy, right? you have to count them out. <laughs> yeah. So what people do. Um, they're all different sizes. I don't know how to do this in weight. How many servings do you think would be in this bag then? In a five ounce bag? How many servings? Mm, five or six. Yes, just over five. So they're saying one ounce is a serving. Okay. Oh. And how many calories? Is this right? Should we be talking about this? Mm, tricky one, isn't it? Well, we just... Mm. Oh, we could give a warning. Let's give a warning now. <laughs> Skip for the next 15 seconds if you don't <laughs> want to hear how many calories are in kettle chips. It is, skip if you need to, 124. Oh, they do that? Yeah. That's interesting. Usually here, chips would get a little bit higher rating. So I would say, okay, is, is there a scenario in which that's how much you would eat and want that particular amount? Not consciously. I mean, there might be times where if they were somewhere and I just had one or two as I was passing by or something i there'd be times when i would eat more by the chip bag (laughs) (laughs) times when i would eat more times when i would eat less the thing is for me chips are like eh. i only really enjoy them with a glass of wine and with other people so for me they're very social if someone said to me i could never eat crisps or chips again 
I think I'd actually be, I'd be a bit like, oh, okay, that's a shame that I don't have that choice anymore, but I'd be okay compared to if someone said you can never eat chocolate or cake again, I would be like, who are you to say that? So I feel like inherently in the serving suggestion, which sometimes is how it's posed, right? The serving suggestion that in and of itself impacts how much you want to eat of it. And that's the part where I was saying in the beginning, I don't, I know what serving sizes are to the point where like, it's very hard for me to imagine how much I'm like for me to just look at something and be like, I don't know what a serving size is. Like, like I always know. And so even though I'm not listening to it, there's a, this awareness of it. And I wonder how much that actually impacts. Right. So if, if you're, if your awareness of that, like there's some impact that has on like what you're doing. I think the way that I handle that now is to chips to me would be something I might in, I might have like the place that they exist in my life is probably mid afternoon. Um, when I'm not hungry for like an ac- actual like snack, which is rare. So most of the time I will be hungry for my afternoon snack and I'll have a proper one. I probably wouldn't have chips in that case because again, I'm not a chip person either, but in a, in a scenario where I'm not super hungry, but I just want a little something, um, probably maybe even a taste hunger thing. I would probably reach my hand in and get like a substantial handful of that and put it in like a little bowl. And that would probably serve the purpose. But I think before the fact that there was a serving size, it would have been like, Oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. So I'm going to either try to do that or I'm going to blow right by that. And there would be no conversation about what I really wanted. You know what I mean? Like the, the, the purpose of the chip would no longer even be relevant. It would just be about doing right or wrong. You know, it would feel a lot more past fail. And what's happening in that moment? Which one? That moment there that you describe. The the past fail one, like yeah. the old me or the new me? The old you. Um, it's all about like, it's not about me. <laughs> it's not about what I want or need. It's not about that anymore at all. It's about what I'm allowed and what I'm not allowed and how that matters. Like then it's all about, are you having the right amount of chips or the wrong amount of chips instead of eating the chips and like experiencing the eating of them. You know what I mean? Like it takes you out of your body. Well, this is making me think of the milkshake experiment. You know, the one Caroline Duna talks about it. The one where depending on how many calories people thought were in the milkshake actually affected their ghrelin production in their bodies. Yeah. And the research will show that if you think you've had a low calorie option, even if you haven't, you are likely to then go on to eat more. So there's something about externalizing these decisions, which is part of what gets people in so much trouble in the first place. So a lot of the stuff that we talk about and other people who work in the same area as us, we're talking about how do we go from that to becoming more internally regulated? Especially if you can't erase what you know, or like, you know, if you know serving sizes and you know that there there is some, some mental awareness of this This is just what I'm trying to say. Like, I I think I do have this. And and I guess the way that I think about it now is I, to do it differently. So before I would have actually counted out the serving size. And now I don't do that. Sometimes I'll think about it. Like, what would I offer somebody else? But also when I look at it, what do I want? Or how much does my hand want to grab? Or how much does my spoon want to take? That's a very vague thing to talk about, but there is some kind of inherent in- intuition around that. There, There's, when my mind is not involved, there is some kind of place where I stop scooping something or I, or I reach in and I get this amount. And then sometimes I might go back and want another handful or something like that, but it's, it's coming from my, bo- <laughs> this is hard to explain. It's coming from my body's cues rather than what's going on in my mind. And and I can feel the difference by actually paying attention to my body instead of into my mind, literally feeling here in my arms and hands and chest or in my head. Like you can tell when you're in your head. To me, I can feel the thinking going on. So I try to get out of that. I noticed for me, there are days when I will eat things and my body will just go, oh, that's enough. Mm-hmm. Like when I was just like, I'm done. And it, it, that comes in a in a very clear way and in a way that there's no battle it's just like don't want anymore and then sometimes I have days where I just feel more bottomless yeah like I can keep going and this is what I think used to happen for me in my 
sort of recovery period for my binge eating was that I would have some of these days where I'm like, oh, that's enough. That's enough. And I feel okay. Like I'm enjoying these foods or maybe a little bit more there, but that's enough. And then I would have a bottomless day, Mm -hmm. a day where it's just like, I am just hungry today. Yeah. And it seems like I'm just going to be a bit hungry all day. And I probably am not going to find that place where I go, no, don't want any more at all. How much am I enjoying this? How do I feel? And and recognizing that sometimes there is this little pull to have a bit more and that's okay. And, and on those days I will eat a lot more. And I kind of trust that they will pass the minute I don't get in a fight with that. Yes. And and this is the scary bit. I think when people are recovering, they're very familiar often with that bottomless feeling and they cannot imagine mm-hmm. that they will ever be in a place where their brain or their body, whatever it is that goes, yeah, we're, we're done. And so where am I going with this in a way that's helpful for other people? Otherwise, it's just like, yay, get me. <laughs> Look what I can do. <laughs> well, um, no, I, there's a places to go with that. I'm sure there is. Do you want to take us to one of them? Yeah, I mean, well, there's there's two things there. One is that the judgment matters and also the respect for variation on any given day matters because what is a serving or a portion for you one day, and that, that actually feels okay, is not necessarily the truth for the next day. So there is no like standard portion. In my experience, there is not. There's sometimes where it's a little bit of something. And there's some days where it's a lot of bit of something and they're both valid. Um, so where we're judging it, that that's where the, the issues come in. And the second thing is it takes a while for your body to tell you that, that you're done because your mind is so used to running things that even in a, whether you're in a restriction place or a binge place, like your, your brain is so busy judging what you're doing that it, you can't hear what's happening in the body. And you would probably imagine as I would used to do that, like, even if my body is finished, my mind's not, you know, and that's huge. And absolutely. That's, that's, that absolutely happens first in recovery where you start to notice that your physical cues are like, okay, like, I think this would be where I'm full, but emotionally I am not finished eating. And that that is taken as a sign of failure rather than a part of the process. I think that, I think that being able to really truly be like, okay, had enough, I'm done and be cool with that comes after dismantling like like the the mental work around this and then the emotional work around this and then the and then the physical cues but then the physical cues with the psychological cues like they all are part of this process that we're constantly judging and feeling like we're failing and until we stop judging all that i don't think we get to a place where you can honestly be like i'm done and when it happens ugh, Honestly, and I never imagined that that would be something that I would ever be able to listen to. I always imagined that I would, I would always want more. I would always, always want more, no matter how much I was physically done with something. And that only changed when I stopped judging that to begin with, which meant I was eating a lot more in the beginning. And at some point as well, you are anticipating how much is going to be enough. Let's say you're dishing yourself up a meal or you're preparing food. That's coming from the mind. How much food do I put on the plate? How much food do I think that I will need? So there's part of me that will kind of go, okay, this is what I think is about how much I might want. And I always have permission to go and have something else afterwards. Interestingly, earlier this week, I had this gnocchi meal and I was really enjoying it and I was really hungry when I ate it. And as it was finishing, I remember thinking, oh my goodness, the food's nearly done and I'm not done. (laughs) Yeah, there was that. And when it finished, I even said to my friend, oh, I feel like I could eat that over again. I was full, but I think I needed a bit more food. And then the next day had this pasta bake meal that normally that would do three meals because it's just a really big portion. And on that day, I was like, actually, no, it only did two meals. Mm. And so there was no judgment that historically, when I've had that pasta dish, which I've probably had about six or seven times, it's always done more than two meals. But on this occasion, it didn't. On this occasion, it was just the two meals. There's something around really recognizing, and this wasn't through hearing it from anybody else. This was actually lived experience of, oh, if I eat a bit less one day, it's kind of okay. I feel hungrier the next day, and then I eat a bit more. And likewise, if I have a day where I end up just eating more than I normally would, the next day, maybe I'm not quite as hungry. Or then maybe I have a hungry week and then I have a less hungry week. 
there's something about trusting the process over time, which takes yeah. time to get to. I'm not suggesting anyone can go from zero to, oh, I just have to trust the process. But a lot of this stuff of figuring out what is the amount of food that feels the best for you is trial and error. Yes. It goes from sometimes eating too much. It goes from sometimes not eating enough. Here's from sometimes leaving too big a gap and then finding you have that bottomless feeling and you, you can't get enough food in compared to other times where you feel like you cook too much and it's hard to throw food away. If we can use that as feedback as opposed to judgment, taking away this idea that eating too much means you got it wrong. Like when you were talking about serving sizes there, when you were right in it, it was there's a right answer here and there's a wrong answer. And if mm. I don't get it perfectly right, what the hell? I'll just let's just get everything wrong. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> yep that's it <laughs> so where would where would people start with that then people who feel like every day they've got that bottomless feeling when it comes to experimenting with this idea of I say portion size I don't mean it as in you have to figure out your portion size but when you're playing around with what feels okay what does that what does that take what are the things that helped you Oh, oh, yeah. Thanks for asking it that way. Cause I don't know that I could tell you in a different way. Um, so I have peanut butter here. I brought it specifically for this episode. It's not just sitting here. Well, if it was no judgment, but peanut butter is one of those things that I used to really like, it's so hard to measure too, because like it gets stuck in the measuring thing and you're like, how much is this really? But like it's two tablespoons here is, is how two tablespoons to me is laughable. But as long as I had this idea, because it's written here, that two tablespoons is something that a normal person would eat, in order to figure out what actually makes sense for me, like it would involve some level of, and I could eat peanut butter just off a spoon, right? But let's say I'm putting it on bread or something like that. I would offer myself more, definitely more than the serving size, but like more than I thought I should like, it has to, it has to come from abundance. I have to have almost too much what, permissively though, not from a scooping point perspective, because if you're like scooping at one scoop and you're just like, I keep wanting more, I keep wanting more. It's because you keep telling yourself that the one more should be enough. Mm. And then you're going to, but if you right at the outset are like, I'm going to take a big, big, huge dollop of peanut butter with my whatever. And maybe two, like way more than you think you should. And that's your starting point. You might actually, I think that that would be the point where I was like, okay, like this is mine to have. I'm not stealing it from the jar. It's it's all mine. And then I can put it away. There's not the pressure that's distracting me from what my body's actually feeling like having. You know what I mean? And there is a point where now, if I were to put that much on my plate, at some point I'd be like, this is sticky and making me feel thirsty. And I like, I, I actually want a different texture with it. Or I think that's enough now. Whereas I couldn't have had that cue if I was just like stealing it. And also in the beginning, I think I could finish a heck of a lot more. And so I would have to have that for a while until I started to get more familiar with the nuances of, do I want something different with this? Do I want this much of it? Like, is it time for a different food? You know what I mean? Like in the beginning, there's such a scarcity around it that you do really want that much. And to allow that to unfold over time with the generous helping. I think this generous helpings idea is what was helpful for me. It's like giving myself way more than I thought I should have, because I think people working on, especially intuitive eating in particular, believe that like in order to eat intuitively, we need to be eating these like expected amounts. And that that's a, that's something that maybe your body can talk to you about later, but in the beginning, that's not clear. And there's scarcity in the psychology, like the milkshake experiment, that's all happening. So that matters. It's changing literally the ghrelin in your body, right? It's not just psychological, it's psychological impacting physiological, and that matters. So there's a process to it and offering yourself more than enough, I think is part of how I got to a place of being able to understand what enough even meant. Agreed. Generous portions, I think is a, a great place to start as well as for me always saying, I can go and have something else. So even when the Nanaki was finishing, I was like, I can have something else afterwards if I want something else afterwards. And knowing that that's always available. And often the idea of something else afterwards, for me, can be even more appealing because it might be that that thing just didn't satisfy me, that I needed something different. I need a different texture or flavor or just something that was different. Um, yeah. Can I speak to that a second? Please do. I know we talked about this on a different episode, but when we were away in in Ireland and we ordered dinner, it was a pretty generous portion. 
What do you say? Yes. I know, that's yeah, a good yeah, yeah. question. Yeah. It was a big bowl, which I love when they serve things in bowls. Um, I love eating out of bowl, but it was like a, a, a good size bowl pot with um, lo- like lots of pasta piled with, you know, meat on top. And I remember when it arrived thinking like, uh, all right, like that's a good amount. I didn't, wasn't sure if I'd finish it or not, but I got about halfway done and I was like, it wasn't satisfying me. I kept eating it because it wasn't satisfying me. I think I would have had half of what I ate if it was satisfying mm-hmm. because but like when you're not satisfied with something, you keep going. Cause you're keep looking for the satisfaction and you're t- and like the judgment might be, I just can't get enough of things. Like I am obsessed with food. Even when I don't like it, I'm obsessed with it. It's like, no, you just haven't hit satiation and you're still seeking it. And you know, at a restaurant, I didn't, you know, I didn't have the liberty of being like, bring me something else, <laughs> you know, but at home you might be like, it might be time to switch. Like I might need a different texture or different flavor or different, you know, something different. Um, but we get caught up in the mind's opinion of ourselves that we just can't seem to be done. That sometimes that in itself is interrupting the cues of, I just want something else. I used to feel so resistant to that knowledge of knowing that this particular food wasn't going to satisfy me. And I think there was something around naming that and going, okay, like this meal isn't going to be particularly satisfying. I can fill myself up from a physical perspective and, and eat as much food as I might physically need, but it's not going to be satisfying. And just feeling that disappointment, like, again, I feel like we're bouncing off the other episode, but when I had that meal the other day where the fajitas, I was like, I'm just not really enjoying this. This is a functional meal. I felt a bit sad about it. And I was like, yeah. well, I guess I'm just going to feel a bit sad about it and I wasn't actually feeling particularly like I wanted something else but then oh my friend got out do you have Tony's Chocoloni yeah the yes I don't like it though too much so what it's like the chocolate bar yeah. or, or the bars with the bubble letters on bubble, yeah probably bubble letters yeah. I think, yeah I don't know why I don't like it so much it, it tastes artificial to me oh it's so good <laughs> so good I'm and, just gonna make sure I'm looking. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. So she gets that, and it's a it's a big, chunky, hearty, big sharing bar. And so I was like, yeah, that that sounds good. Let's let's eat some of that while we're watching Flight of the Concords because she's never watched it. I was introducing her to it. Have you ever watched Flight of the Concords? No, but I know what it is. So I was I was uh, eating the chocolate, and we were both having a bit, and we were sharing it. And in my mind, I, you know, that whole idea of anticipating in advance how much you're likely to eat. When I saw the size of this chocolate bar, I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll have a bit of it. But I wouldn't have anticipated that I would have eaten half the bar. But I did. Do you know what? I enjoyed every single mouthful to the point that even when I had the last one, I was sad that it, <laughs> it had gone because I swear, and this is what I think it's just, I don't know what they put in it, something. But even at the last mouthful, it, I swear it tasted pretty much as good as the first one. Well, yeah, that's good. Yeah. How did you know how to stop? It, it we finished it. Oh, so there wasn't <laughs> more. <laughs> we stopped when it ran out. <laughs> Got it. But there was no part when we're talking about the judgment or the fighting with ourselves about it. I remember thinking like, oh, I, I ate way more than I thought I was going to eat at that. And that's okay. That's that. What if you can't get past the judgment? Well, I think that's what the work is. I don't, I don't know that you can heal your relationship with food without doing some of this work on the judgment. We can't just stop the judgment. The judgment comes, it's conditioned, it's going to come in, the feeling's going to come in, everything's going to come in straight away. So th- then it begins with how we react to the judgment. Yeah, right. It's the reconciling of it. is the C word. Always. Connect. Or compassion. And I curiosity. I know, I know there's three. <laughs> um... Uh, there was this, so when I was recovering, I remember, um, somebody posted this and I'm like, Oh, thank you. I remember it was such a relief. She was talking about Mac and cheese and making Mac and cheese. And this was a smaller bodied non-diet practitioner. And she was talking about how she had just made Mac and cheese for her kids and ate the whole box herself and had to make them a different box. She was like, some days I'm just hungry enough to eat a whole box of Mac and cheese. And it was the first time I ever saw anyone say that. And I was like, yeah, thank you for normalizing the fact that like some days you can eat a whole box of, box of mac and cheese. Nobody talks about this, right? And and here's the thing is 
some days I can also eat a whole box of mac and cheese and some days I don't want to. And I think it's this respect for the ebb and flow, right? On the days where I'm going to eat a whole box of mac and cheese or, or that that happens, it's like, it's not saying something about you. It's just saying something about how, how you are today. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I understand that in a binge place that might happen every day. We might never get away. And I think there's other factors going on there then as well. But even in a recovered place, there are days where you could eat a whole box of mac and cheese just because of what you were talking about earlier. There is this ebb and flow and that matters. And so I felt, I feel that it's impro- important to carry this message on <laughs> that some days you might eat a whole box of mac and cheese. And that, that is something that normal people might do, even though that is, I, I guess, what is it like 3.5 servings? Cause I, if I remember correctly, that's how many servings are in a box. And yeah, like some days you can just eat that much. What matters to me, and this was what I was thinking yesterday when I finished the chocolate, what matters to me is just simply the question, was that compulsive? Did that feel compulsive, that eating? That matters. It doesn't mean that if it did feel a bit compulsive that, oh my goodness, that's wrong and let's catastrophize. But if it did feel a bit compulsive, I need to understand why. I need to make sense of that. So sometimes it can be simply, I didn't eat enough. So it felt compulsive yeah. because yeah, I yeah, felt yeah. like that bottomless feeling. It could be hormonal. It could be anything. But I I need that context in order for me to feel okay, to be able to yeah. make sense of what this is. Because for so long, it was just confusion and chaos. And the only reason I ate compulsively was just because I was somehow broken in some way and wired wrong. Yeah. So even if it's just, oh, I feel like that felt a bit like I went unconscious there. Okay, well, where do I need to meet myself within that? And it's that often if there's a desire to go unconscious, whether it's, you know, playing a game on my phone or whatever it might be, I just want to acknowledge whatever that thing was. And that tends yeah. to remove the compulsion. It can yeah. just, then it can turn into a choice of something and a way to look after myself that doesn't feel like I'm a, I'm running away from something. I'm just yeah. trying to make myself feel okay. It's a difference. Yes. And compulsion can also be guilt driven. Like yeah. if you're judging what you're doing, it can make it more compulsive because there's a rebel, you know, because there's a part of you that's like, but I'm allowed um, or running away from yourself. And the thing about it is I don't believe there's ever a reason that you eat compulsively or binge eat or whatever it might be that doesn't have a reason. Like there's always a reason. And so to me, this like just, just strips away a lot of the guilt. And that comes from be- because I do find value in me in meaning and understanding why. So as long as I can understand why I'm like, oh. Well, then it's not just because I'm a disaster. It's because I'm avoiding my feelings or because I'm hungry or, you know, whatever it might be. But having the reason itself is the compassion for me. It's like, oh, oh, well, then that makes sense then. And as long as it makes sense, it's not my fault. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, it just (laughs) feels like I can wrap my head around that a lot easier than I could before when it was just this feeling of like, I just have no control because I have no control because I'm a jerk. Mm -hmm. And even if it doesn't make sense, it's still not your fault. There probably still is a reason in there, even if you can't find it, just saying that in case anyone else is hearing that slightly differently. What about habit-based serving? You know what I mean? Like when we have something, because we've always had that much, you know, especially in recovery, I've had that come up with clients who say, I think I'm just eating this much because I always have. Can it be just a habit? I think the first bit is what are you making it mean? What's the narrative around you having that amount? Is there a should in there? Because it could be habit that you have that amount, but does that matter then? Mm. As you know, with my previous breakfast, it would always be four of the oat cakes. Like there wouldn't be a question of how many oat cakes I wanted. It's a habit. Like this is how many oat cakes I have. This is how many slices of cucumber. I yeah, have. yeah, yeah. You it's had a, like, <laughs> it's a whole methodology. Thing. So it, it's reminding me of that episode. Do you remember where I spoke to you? Gosh, this would have been back at the end of last year where... I had my friend living with me and we'd got in this habit of having cake every afternoon. Yes. We'd go for a walk and we would get some cake. And there was then something about it that made me feel like I couldn't not get the cake. Yeah. It was because it was starting to feel less like a choice. And I think that might be the bit that some people find uncomfortable is this feels like a habit. I don't feel like I'm choosing to have this amount. I guess the first question is, why does it matter? Because that might bring out some sneaky restrictive thinking or some judgment or some guilt or there might be something some emotional charge around it if it genuinely feels like a habit I normally just say play about with it if it if it feels right. like something you don't want it to be a habit play about with it if let's say I mean using the cake example like at 4 p.m every day you have a slice of cake well just 
eat the cake somewhere else. Have a different kind of cake. Have something slightly different. Just make each day a very conscious choice without trying to immediately remove something. If you're finding that triggering, because I'm guessing if it's coming yeah. up in a conversation, someone's saying, I have this habit and I, I feel like I can't break it. So there's a sense of feeling like you are out of control of something. So I think it's just about being a little bit more intentional without triggering off this, I can't have this thing or I shouldn't be having this thing. Those are the two problematic thoughts that are going to potentially have a backlash if you're operating yeah. from them. Well, I think people will say like, oh, I just eat so much because I'm in the habit of eating so much. Or even like I binge just because it's a habit to binge. And I think mm, maybe, but even the awareness of it itself, I don't think the habit, there, there's a habit to binge without something else attached to it. I don't think it stands alone usually, but like there can be habit. For example, I remember like a time in my life where I would wake up and start binging immediately. I would just pour myself a bowl of cereal and have the whole box like in the end. And I think there was like a habitual element to it because it was my expectation of what I did. And so here's the thing, having if, if I had had aware, if I'd been like, oh, I think I'm doing this because it's a habit. First of all, I don't think it really was. I think it was partly like it just made it easier for me to continue doing it. But that wasn't the reason that I was doing it. So that's something to look at. But also like if you have a habitual amount of food that you eat at a certain time of day, or if you have a habit of, of like, for example, night eating, you know, and you, and you end up having like a ice cream sundae every night before bed and you have a problem with that because then you have acid reflux and, you know, but, but I can't break this habit. First of all, naming that something's a habit is still not a criticism. And I think that people will be like, I just do this because it's such a habit for me. It's like, well, okay, <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> like habits, habits are real, you know, that they're part, they're wired in, in, in a certain way. So just having awareness of that doesn't like is a step, to, you know, is a step. You don't need to judge yourself for having had built in this habit. But also if we try to change a habit in too big of a way or too quickly or too many of them at once, I think the body does sometimes respond defensively. So remembering too, that just because you've identified that you might have a habit of having a certain amount of cereal in a bowl, doesn't mean that just because you've been like, I think this might be a habit that now all of a sudden you can go like, you can cut that in half and your body won't respond to that somehow. You know what I mean? Like if it is making you feel ill to have that much and you can, I like your term play around, like to play around with that without thinking, well, I shouldn't be because it's just a habit. Therefore I should have actually half of it. It's kind of like, go slow with yourself, change habits slowly. If you know, because your body might be reacting in a certain way to that. Eating is habitual. I'm in the habit yeah. of having breakfast. So if I go too far into the morning and I haven't had breakfast, my body or my mind, like there's something that's in me that's going to make me aware of that. Our bodies sync up with circadian rhythms and our ghrelin has a whole circadian cycle as well. So it could be if you're always eating a particular thing at 4 p.m., 4 p.m. could come, your ghrelin starts to mm -hmm, rise. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a real physical craving for this thing. And again, first of all, the question is, why is this a problem for you in your mind? But it could be that, okay, well, instead of having the thing at 4 p.m., let's try having it at 3 p.m. It'd be bringing it earlier. So it'd probably bring it at a time when your body is not particularly craving it, as opposed to trying to take something out. If you have a brain and a nervous system that can respond with compulsive eating and binging, when it feels like it's under threat, if you trigger that threat system, even if you believe or are eating enough overall, you could end up with a backlash that way. It yeah, can feel yeah. like a deprivation. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, right? And then other times, it, because I'm now, of course, devil's advocate me is like, well, there was a time I remember where I had a habit of, or it was just my process to like, gosh, because for 25 years, I stood in my pantry and ate, right? Like the secret eating, the, the, I'm, I'm just getting it. Like, I'm not really eating, eating, you know? So there was this habit I had of eating a certain amount of food out of a bag in a certain place. And I remember in recovery being like, oh, I, I don't, I can actually just plate it. Like I could just actually have it on purpose. And I probably actually don't know that I need X amount anymore, you know? And so I sort of like trialed that and it was, it was like, oh yeah, I actually feel like I'm modifying what my portions are because, and portions being like, again, there's never every just one, but there was a change that was calling, you know, in the recovery process itself. That's okay. Like it's okay to play with that. 
as it makes sense and as it feels safe. And you also reserve the right to say like, no, I still need as much as this. Like I still need to do it this way, but there might be little pieces of it that you want to like play play around with as as far as like eating standing up or sitting down or eating with it plated or right out of the bag. And neither one's right or wrong. It's just a matter of having awareness of like, why are you, we doing something and are we doing something that no longer makes sense to us or that we'd like to change for some reason that isn't rooted in like a punishment and that's okay. It's okay to do that with curiosity. And, and I think slowly. I think it's worth mentioning when we're talking about portion sizes that for many people, they're using calories as this measurement and they have this idea in their head of number of calories that they want to or feel like they should need or should be sticking to. And many people might be aware of this or not. We don't know how many calories our body requires or needs on any given day. We don't know because that can fluctuate on a day by day basis. It fluctuates a lot from person to person. There are these general guidelines out there and you don't know with your thinking brain where you fall on that spectrum. And the other thing as well that not everybody is necessarily aware of, but when you eat food, you don't absorb all the calories in the food. And one person and another person can eat exactly the same food and both absorb different amount of calories. This is another reason why I think this externalizing portion sizes and how much you think you should or shouldn't eat will tie you up in a bind because we won't get it right. If we're trying to use our thinking mind to figure out exactly how much we need to eat, we will not get it right. And even the word right is a bit problematic, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where people get stuck on that, I think, is that like people will figure out how much they need for their body size to say, to say, to stay a certain way. And then that becomes, because that's what I did. It was like, I don't care what other people need. I did sort of let go of that comparison, but it was like, but I know how much my body needs to stay at this size. And that's what I need to adhere to. Otherwise my body will change. So the serving sizes and the portion sizes were de- were more about me staying where I thought I needed to be based on my own evidence of what caloric amounts led to what weight for me. Gotta let that check go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I didn't dang it. Because to... now you're like, I knew how many calories I needed to. It was just I did. I <laughs> did. I absolutely knew. <laughs> Yeah. And it was more than it was more than the average recommended, you know, the RDA that it was more than that. But I was like, that's okay. This is how much my body needs to stay here. And that's what I'm going to then subscribe to. But the problem with that was when, when you're calorie counting to stay at a certain size that you've sort of figured out that, that calculation, <laughs> what was hard for me was that like, it was like, okay, then that's the amount I'm going to have every day. <laughs> it's like, yeah, or days where I was bottomless. And there were days where I, you know, there was because I was restricting in the first place, but like my natural fluctuations, it was like, I didn't know what to do with all that because it was, it didn't go according to that formula. And there was fear as I approached the calorie ceiling, you know, like, oh my gosh, I'm way hungrier than this. I can tell I'm going to go over this today. And so I would fight with myself to stay below. All of that was this effort to manage, to micromanage my body size. And this is an important point is that if I were listening to this episode, still trying to micromanage my body size, all the advice would be moot because that goal would interrupt the pr- the processes we're, we're talking about here, like compassion and um, fluctu- respect for fluctuation. And like you're, you're putting yourself in a box when you're micromanaging your weight. The only way that I was able to actually feel what a portion, the right quote unquote portion, portion size for me was on any given day. And is still the reason I'm able to sense that is because I'm not micromanaging the the weight because that expectation cuts me off at the neck and I can't then feel I'm not at liberty to take those cues because I'm doing some a calculation up here that isn't going to met those things aren't going to mesh so uh, you can't learn it unless you're not micromanaging and you also won't be able to learn this if you are not eating regularly if there's still too much chaos moving in and out of restriction and trying to figure out oh what's my portion what's the amount of food that feels best for me that's going to be all messed up so for a lot of people doing some mechanical eating that breakfast lunch and dinner getting a bit of a rhythm your body's starting to trust you these things need to happen first I know what I would have been I'd have been very impatient I would have listened to this podcast I'd have been like okay right 
I'll trust you guys. I'll give myself generous portions, but I better know within a week how much is yeah. the right amount for me. Because as as well, like as our bodies change, as we get older, our bodies just shifting and going through different stages of our lives, how much we eat can go up and down too. So it would it wouldn't be a case of arriving at oh, okay, like this is the amount that I need for breakfast. This is the amount I need right. for lunch. Right. You're going to be going over, under, over, under, over, under. Yeah. I, I had a client this morning who was talking to me about making tuna fish in, you know, out of the can. She was like, do you eat a half a can for dinner or lunch or, or a whole can? And I was like, I don't know. It depends on the day. Like it depends on, it depends. And there isn't like a standard serving that is right or wrong. Um, It's, it's really just what you're feeling like you need. And that's so vague. And I get that. And I know how annoying that sounds like feel what you need. It's like, yeah, all, when all you feel is that you want more and more all the time, this is a really hard concept to respect. But, but I think the point of this is that that is not something you start out with. Again, that comes later when the compassion is there, the judgment is less, the micromanagement of weight is less, you know, we're, when we're eating in a more regulated way, that is when portion sizes begin to reveal themselves as far as like what you need and how much you need, like being in touch with that again is a later part of the process. But I would say that, you know, another TLDR of this episode of like, if you're going to take anything away from it, I think it's about what, what a bag or a container says the portion size is, I would just completely disregard. I, I think they're, they're underestimating things so that their calories can look lower because this is psychologically proven to be more appealing to, for purchasing. Like this is a capitalism thing. So ignore, ignore, or if you know it and you, and you're aware of it, assume that you might very well need more than that and offer yourself more. That is I think the starting point of, of, of not using the, what they're telling you uh, portion sizes as the right thing, you know, that's not necessarily true at all and start with more and see how that feels. And also I would encourage people not to fall into the trap of assuming that you should know how much before you've eaten, before you started eating, that you should know how much is the amount for you to eat rather than going in and figuring it out. Because I think when people are doing they're starting intuitive eating or they're going into recovery that, okay, I'll eat more, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to overdo it. I want to figure mm. out very quickly. And if you kid yourself into believing that you are further along than you are, you will keep being thrown back again. It doesn't do you any credit because I, I mean, I, I, I'm just such an impatient person. I hear this and I'd be like, I'm just going to do all of it at once because I can do all of it at once. Cause I'm a multitasker. I can do a lot. I am very productive when I want to be. And this was the one area where it really did take a long time. Sorry, folks. <laughs> take a long time. <laughs> That's going to sound horrible for people no, who have leave, headphones leave it out. in. It out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> boom, boom. It was just, I was just looking for me. Okay. Or anything else. I just wanted to take a little. Yeah. My, my bag of chips tells me how many chips. Oh, is it 10 then? Nine. Nine? That's a very random yeah. number. Nine chips. Nine chips. But like, what is that telling me? I guess they have to start. I guess they have to base it on something. Fine. But I find them to be more often than not underestimated about what people normally eat, especially cereal and ice cream. Oh, yeah. Oh, cereal's ridiculous. You put it in a bowl and it's like. It's and you're like, like, like four and a half servings. Cup. Yeah, exactly. And same with ice cream. I never have a half a cup of ice cream. Yeah. At least with the Believe. number, of, at least with the number of chips or crisps, that's not that I want it to be easier for people because we're saying disregard them. Ours is always done in weight, so it's like, yeah, let me just get my scales out before I decide how many crisps. Yeah, that's even worse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Alrighty. You want crisps? I actually don't like these ones. They're lightly salted, and I like mine with a bit of flavor. Um, no, I'm actually getting hungry. Even it's, I'm getting hungry for lunch. It's only 11 here, um, but I can tell I'm getting hungry for lunch. So this is a time where I would not choose the chips. I want like, I want a meal. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't want the chips because I could tell that what I, I would not be satisfied. So I just keep going and going and I would end up bleh. like real time discussion of. Yeah. But now people are going to go, oh, I shouldn't eat chips before lunch. Oh no, this is just a choice. And if I was hungry enough, I would. And if I wasn't going to be able to have lunch in like 45 minutes. I would have chips to stave off the hunger. There's no, I think, no you, I think you just told, makes sense for you. I think you just told people that if they're going to have lunch in 45 minutes, that they shouldn't eat crisps. I think you've just, okay, then boom, boom, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, probably, you're probably right. Then 
no, no. That is what people think. As long as we've made a big enough fuss about it afterwards that it's not what you're saying, I think we can leave it in. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying well, this is what makes sense for me today. I know. I hear you, Steph. Mm, I hope everybody else does too. Yeah. You do you, everybody. Already. Thanks right. for listening. Bye bye. Tell a friend, rate the show. Uh, Steph's got some stuff to sell, so have a look at her links below. <laughs>